Now, why did I decide to do this by the window? It's such bad lighting. Cool. So today we are doing topic three, quantitative chemistry from the GCC AQA chemistry CGP textbook. Uh, as normal, we're making a mind map. I have made a mind map. Look at that. Isn't it nice? All colour coded. And yeah, let's get into the video. The relative formula mass of a compound is the relative atomic numbers of a compound added together. E.g. H2O, or water, is two hydrogens, which is one plus one, plus an oxygen, which is 16. So the final compound is 16 plus two, which is 18. Using this, the percentage mass of an element in its compound can also be worked out by dividing the AR of the compound by the MR of the product, and then multiplying by 100. E.g. oxygen makes up 88.89% of the mass of water. These can be made into fairly complicated questions in the exam, so it's best to nail the basics here. And I will leave a link down below to a worksheet if you need some practice, or there are questions in the AQA CGP chemistry textbook. A mole is simply the name given to an amount of substance, or more specifically, the number of particles divided by Avogadro's constant, which is 6.023 times 10 to the power of 23. This is very useful for chemists, because it turns out one mole of molecules of any substance will have a mass in grams equal to the AR or MR of, the su of that substance. E.g. carbon's AR is 12, so one mole of carbon is 12 grams exactly, and carbon dioxide's MR is 44, so one mole of CO2 is 44 grams. This means 12 grams of carbon and 44 grams of CO2 both contain the same number of particles, one mole, or 6.023 times 10 to the 23. Now, now comes perhaps the most important formula in chemistry, the golden triangle of mass, moles and MR, because the mass in grams of any substance is equal to the number of moles that a product contains, multiplied by its MR. This comes up a surprising amount in the GCSE exams, but sometimes in much more complicated ways, as explained later. During a chemical reaction, no atoms are destroyed or created, as they are simply rearranged into a new format. This means mass across all products is the same as the mass across all reactants. In real life, mass may seem not to be conserved for one of two reasons. There are gases involved, which are coming from or being released to the air, thus meaning that they can't be weighed on a measuring scale. Gas can be collected as a product enclosed in the reaction site. One way to do this is a diagram drawn here. Big numbers in front of the formulas tell us how many moles of that substance takes part compared to other parts. If there is no number, the number of moles is just one. For an equation to be balanced, the numbers of each substance must be the same. E.g. if there's two chlorines on one side of the equation, there must be two chlorines on the other side. Also, even if separated or in the format Cl2 instead of 2Cl, the little numbers should not be changed when balancing an equation, only the numbers of moles for each substance. This said, you can also use mass to help balance equations. I like to do this visually, so I'll explain whilst drawing a table. Along the top is the unbalanced equation, and down the sides are mass, moles and MR, in this order. First, divide mass by MR, to find the number of moles for each substance. Then divide the number of moles by the smallest amount of moles. So one amount in the equation is now one. If all the numbers aren't whole, multiply them all by the same numbers until they are. You can then finish, off the finish with the table and write the balanced symbol equation off to one side. Equations stop when one reactant is used up and all the other reactants are in excess. They are usually this way to make sure the limiting reactant is used up, and so the amount of limiting reactant which is used up is directly proportional to how much product is eventually made. This can be used to find out from how much reactants you have, how much product will eventually be made. This is also shown in a table here, 
where you write out the balanced equation at the top and find the MR for each substance. Then find out the moles for what you can, and because all substances with the same large number have the same number of moles, their masses can be known too. You should be able to use the mass, moles and MR formula in lots of different ways, using the rules above. But remember, the masses you work out are called the theoretical yield, and the actual yields will almost never be achieved, so will be less. Another important rule to note is that one mole of any gas occupies 24 decimeters cubed at room temperature, which is 20 degrees, and pressure, 1 atm. This is shortened to RTP. An example of this is chlorine. 35.5 grams of chlorine is one mole. So at RTP will be 24 decimeters cubed. This can also be used in equations between gases to find volumes and can thus be used in concentration equations. Concentration is the amount of a substance in the volume of a solution. The more solute in the solution, the higher the concentration. The easiest way to measure the concentration is by measuring the mass and volume of the solution, then using this equation. Concentration in grams per decimeter cubed equals the mass of solute in grams divided by the volume of solvent in decimeters cubed, or concentration in moles per decimeters cubed, moles of the solute divided by the volume of the solvent. You can also be asked to do concentration calculations in your exams. One practical which will almost certainly be examined on is titrations, where you find the exact volume of two solutions that can completely react together. Concentration calculations are frequently asked about here because the concentration of the acids are not known, so a table can also be used as shown in the example question here. Hey, so it's 6am and I just realised I didn't explain this question in the script. So um, here we go, this is an example GCC question and I don't know if you can read my handwriting. A student started with 30 centimetres cubed of sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, of an unknown concentration in a flask. She found by titration that it took an average of 25.0 centimetres cubed, 0 0.1 mole per decimetres cubed solution of sodium hydroxide to neutralise the sulfuric acid. Find the concentration of the acid in moles per decimeters cubed. Now, I always like to do a table for this. So, there we go. So across the top, I put my balanced equation. Uh, it's very important that it's balanced, so at the end, well, so for the moles bit, that we know we can have the right amount of moles. So down the side then, we write volume, moles, and concentration. Now concentration can come in two different um, uh, units, as explained above. So this one is going to be moles per decimeters cubed, because that is what the question wants. Moles per decimeter cubed. Now, they also like to be tricky with the units because in the question they also put them as centimetres cubed, but you actually need them in decimetres cubed. So you need to convert all centimetres cubed into decimetres cubed. So I'm just going to do that now. And there we go. So now we need to put into the table the things that we know. So we know the volumes for the sulfuric acid. Now that's the sulfuric acid and the sodium hydroxide. So it's going to be 0 0.025, 0 0.03. We know the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. And we know that we need to find concentration of the sulfuric acid. So for now we're just going to put a question mark there. 
Now, step one is to find the number of moles that this volume and concentration of sulfuric acid actually has in it. We're going to ignore this two bit for the second. We'll come back to that later. So we can see from our equations up here that moles per decimeter cubed, the concentration is the moles divided by the volume. So to get the moles, we need to do the concentration times the volume. So that is what I have done here. So 0 0.025 times 0 0.1 makes 0 0.0025. That is step number one. Basically, the way I do this is just to try and fill out the table until I get my answer. We don't need to worry about this stuff over here because this is irrelevant to the question. Now, going back to the numbers up here, we can tell that because that's the two, because that's a kind of hidden one right there, um, you want to divide this mole value by two because you know that this is, this number represents two lots of that. But when we want to move it over, that one only has one lot of that. So step two is to divide it by two. I don't know if this is making any sense. As I said, it's 6 a.m. So 0 0.0025 divided by two is 0 0.00125. Now, step three, we have all of the pieces of the puzzle that we need to find the concentration. So now we can go back to our equation up here. So moles divided by volume is the concentration. So therefore down here, the moles divided by the volume is also the concentration. So we're doing 0.00125 moles divided by 0.03, which gives you 0.00417. Now, in the question, in the, in the exam, you have some working out space, which will usually be about three or four lines. Uh, this is where I will put my table with the three down here and then the fourth line is the equation up here and then the answer space will be like over here somewhere. So I need you to make sure that you write down the units if they're not put there already because if you remember it's a very easy way to gain a mark but if you forget it's a very easy way to lose a mark. The concentration as they wanted it in the question needs to be in moles per decimeter cubed. I hope that is helpful. Let's go back to the drawing. Concentration in grams per decimeter cubed can also be converted to concentration in moles per decimeter cubed by finding the MR of the substance and using the mass equals moles times MR equation. Atom economy is the percentage of reactants forming useful products. Everything else is waste. This can be figured out by using the equation. Atom economy equals the MR of desired products divided by the MR of all reactants times 100. A 100% atom economy means all the products made are useful. And so the environmental friendliness increases. E.g. using hydrogen and oxygen to make water as a 100% yield. Atom economy is better for the environment because less non-renewable materials are used up and less waste is produced, which also increases profits. Furthermore, waste could be produ produced less by having useful byproducts, although having only one product is still preferable for making the process more efficient. Other factors for choosing reactions include yield, rate of reaction and position of equilibrium.
Percentage yield shows the actual yield as a percentage of the theoretical yield. It can be found by the equation mass of product divided by mass of theoretical product times 100. The higher the percentage yield, the more efficient the reaction, the less it costs, and the less waste it produces. The percentage yield is always less than 100% because of three things. Number one, not all reactants make the products, e.g. in equilibrium reactions. Number two, there might be unexpected side reactions because of impurities in the products. Number three, some of it can get lost when you separate it from the reaction mixture.